guys. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. We have uh, today we have a lot of board work, not quite as much in the way of slides, but a lot of board work. And we're actually building a lot of slides today, which is the good news is that I missed you guys, right? Lecture, <laughs> uh, So this is actually in some ways one of my favorite lectures, and I switched the order of things this year because um, I wanted I wanted to kind of get a good understanding of sort of the, how signals work their way through sort of being generated with transverse modulization in the body, to how we actually like to record something. Um, and what's, what's out of order about this is there's two spatial localization lectures. And we're going to see that a little bit today. We're going to touch on that a little bit today. Um, one of the complicated things I think in MR is conceptually there's a lot of sort of new things. So I'm going to try to touch on a few things today. We're going to come back to those concepts. And then we're going to dig deeper into um, signal equation. So like how we Equations that are shown in the background there. What, what I like, uh, and I think you agree, uh, like about this lecture is just that we get a, a, a good, a, again, a good understanding of how we can excite magnetization and even possibly record a voltage. And if we record a voltage at 64 megahertz, like what does that have to do at all with case space? And what does that have to do with imaging? Right? So we're going to try to get our way all the way through that. If we don't, that's fine. But that's the goal. Uh, and then hopefully at the end of today, or at the end of the day after you go back and study and review the material, you'll have a pretty good understanding of this so-called MR signal equation, which is really kind of key to understanding uh, how, we, how we do imaging. So far, we've been talking about like excitation and which contrast, for example. So with that, we'll get underway. Uh, Mike um, gave the Grading Echo lecture last time. It looks like he covered a lot of material, uh, which is good, but at the same time, maybe not as fast. Um, the principle, like, again, this, this class is a little bit tricky. Mathematically, I want you to understand for the Grading Echoes, for example, how they generate image contrast and what kinds of variables are available for manipulating image contrast. And then, you know, kind of the second half of that lecture is really sort of like a lot of tricks, like a lot of different things we can do with grading echo imaging, just so you get a sense for some of the applications and some of the sort of more technical things that we can do. But the focus was really on uh, maybe being able to describe the pros and cons of, of a GRE acquisition, and especially uh, with some comparisons to other technologies. So what was a nice advantage? Fast, right? Uh, and you'll get some sense for that when we work on the MR systems themselves. Fundamentally, it has to do with the kinds of TRs we need to get, say, T1 weighted imaging that are kind of short. Uh, whereas with the spin echo sequence, they tend to be long. Uh, so there's a speed advantage there. Um, who can explain or sort of suggest a reason why grading echoes can't acquire true T2 contrast? T2 star. It is T2 star, right? So why is it T2 star? What is it that's missing? No refocusing pulse, right? So the focusing pulse is what really gets us that you know, T2 contrast. And those other sources of the law of resonance as they accumulate give us this other thing that we call T2 star. Um, what was the reason, and, and this, uh, I, I talked about this with Mike, and, uh, and I know we at least got through the material. We can talk about it more if we need to, but what was the advantage of spoilers? Why, and why were they typically? Say it, say it again, like it's suppressed. Suppress the uh, transfer magnetization. That's right. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. So after we've acquired an echo, we're sort of done with the magnetization. And spoiling is a way of getting rid of it so that it doesn't somehow enter into a subsequent TR. And if we don't control the magnetization and it's still there somewhere, it could leak into the next echo that we want to acquire and contaminate it. And so spoilers are a way of sort of destroying the magnetization. Uh, we'll talk about this some today because uh, it'll come up a little bit, uh, but there's, you should have some basic understanding of how to calculate scan time, right? Uh, and all I'm talking about there is that we typically define a TR, right? And the TR is the time it takes to acquire, say, a single echo in the simplest case. And so our if we need to calculate our scan time, we have to multiply the TR by what? The number of phases in building lines, or the number of number of lines of data we to acquire from that experiment. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit more today. Um, but that's an important consideration because I want you to start thinking about what is the TR. Well, the TR sounds short, 10 milliseconds, that's pretty fast, right? Uh, but then you multiply 10 milliseconds by 100 lines of data you want to acquire, and all of a sudden it takes you a second to get an image. And that's actually kind of long compared to lots of imaging devices. Compared to how many data points you get with a Nikon camera with a, you know, with a really high resolution digital map, right? Hundreds of 
microseconds, you get a full frame of the game. Right? So there's really big differences in uh, data rates and optimization in many of these systems. Um, uh, you should now uh, understand well how to, op how to drive an optimal flip angle for a training interval sequence and understand why we might want to use that. Uh, what is that specific flip angle problem? And it's the Holmes thing again, right? And at least in the lecture material that Mike ran through, there's maybe two different reasons you would want to use two different ways to sort of pick your Holmes standard. But one was to get the maximum signal for a particular tissue, and then a slightly different reason was you might pick, you might pick a flip angle to give you the maximum contrast between two tissues, just to give you an idea of the two targeted for the interval. No, it's an experiment, but you sort of want to check that out. Um, and then I think at the very end of that lecture, he was able to get into some principles of fat water separation and sort of what that might be useful for. Um, who can suggest something about uh, what was the sort of the basis for being able to do fat water separation? What's different about fat and water? Phase. Phase one phase. Yeah, so they do have different phase, but what is it that gives them different phase? Chemical shift, right? So fat has a different resonance frequency. It's chemically shifted. It's shielded. The electron shielding is such that fat resonates at a slightly different frequency. And so now you have a slightly different frequencies between fat and water. And if they're different in frequency for some finite period of time, then their transverse magnetization components can be out of phase. And so this is the concept that he was alluding to. But if you have fat and water out of phase, and in fact you can have many echo times and get many phase differences between the magnetization, you can start to calculate fat images and water images. Uh, and increasingly what people are interested in doing is actually calculating like fat fractions. What's the, what's the fraction of fat in a pixel? Uh, and that gives you information about the fraction of fat of a second, fraction of <laughs> the fraction of fat in the liver, right? Uh, and really diagnostic. I mean, this is really extraordinary if you think about it, right? Put someone in the scanner, and if you can do the experiment under you know really carefully controlled conditions, you can say, you know, sorry, but you have fatty liver disease, and that needs to be addressed. And you know, the only other way to do that right now is biopsy, right? So you can go in and take out a chunk of someone's liver, and a chunk is like. Basic procedure, it's costly, and it's complications, and so forth. Put someone in an MR scanner and contrast and figure out what the problem is. So, really, a, a really a pretty remarkable problem. Okay, so that's sort of just a review of where we were, uh, hopefully, in that lecture. Questions about kind of that material or something conceptual that come up with that? So uh, I'll remind you of a couple things then. In the last couple lectures, we've talked about spin echoes and we've talked about gradient echoes. And we wrote out a lot of things on the board, right? And we finally understood that uh, the amplitude of the echo, and by that we were referring to the amplitude of the transverse magnetization at a specific time, which was the echo time. That's what we generally cared to keep track of the magnetization of the echo. So there was a rather, uh, you know, slightly lengthier expression for the amplitude of the echo in the spin echo experiment. But it's usually true that our TE is quite a bit shorter than our TR. TE might be 10 milliseconds and our TR might be a thousand times, right? That's a 10 to 1 ratio, and that seems pretty good. And so then we can simplify this expression just a little bit uh, so that we can see that we could generate quoton density weighted con contrast or T1 weighted contrast or, in fact, T2 weighted contrast, depending on how we change our TR and change our TE. And we went through several examples of that. In the gradient echo lecture, uh, we ended up with a similar expression. Uh, and there was, a, there was a dependence on a new parameter here, so not just TE and TR, but also flip angle, right? That's a little bit complicated. There's a sine on top and a cosine on the bottom, but not that big of a deal. And instead, of course, having T2 contrast, we have T2 star contrast, one of the first things that we were talking about. And so uh, what's important to sort of remember is, you know, we write it this way in the book, at least I'm using this in the lecture, when we talk about the amplitude of the echo, we're talking about the, the magnitude or the amplitude of the transverse magnitude. It's all about what's happening to MXY at a specific time at the echo time, right? And the forms of these expressions are actually pretty similar, right? This top row times uh, the bracketed term is really, it's identical, right, to the, the sort of leading term on top here, right? They're both multiplied by some exponential omega for T2. So they look relatively similar. The big difference, of course, is how readily lactation changes and how flip uh, angle changes. But again, the point is to remember that we can change the signal at the, at the timing of 
according to these expressions. And of course, the amplitude, the echo will be different for different pixels, right? For this pixel, for that pixel, for this pixel, for that pixel, because every pixel will have uh, whatever sort of T1 or T2 star. So that begins to give us some understanding of how imaging can be used. Um, what we haven't seen yet, and what we're going to get in today, uh, get into today, is how we can actually start thinking about encoding spatial information. So this is all about sort of manipulating the contrast. Now, how do we encode spatial information so we can draw that out of our imaging system and then build and reconstruct the image? So that's uh, that's kind of what I'm going to get into today. Um, yeah, so a big challenge in MR, and really this is still keeping the field busy, is really about how we encode spatial information in the MR, and then how we can increasingly do reconstructions from limited data sets. I'll show you how to do reconstruction. We'll talk about reconstructing uh, images when we have sort of complete data sets, but a big part of the field right now is what we call a sparse data set. And the advantage of doing something sparsely is if I can get away with acquiring in some unusual way far less of the data, and yet still reconstruct an adequate image, I can scan it. researchers as well as for the experimental projects. Okay, so again, I've got some learning objectives here. I'll have you or ask that you go back and sort of reflect on these at the end of the lecture, and then we'll see how well we did with them. So I want to uh, go back to this diagram, which uh, we used for a while, and then we sort of got away from it, and now we're kind of coming back to it. Um, and the idea of today, a big part of today, is to talk about how we can have transverse magnetization that could be some function of time. That's what those points, what those echo expressions were about, or at least in part about. Uh, we'll, we'll see a little bit about how we can actually in, uh, add the spatial encoding here, which is to say that our transverse magnetization can become a function of space and time, a function of position. And I use the R vector just to do generally a description of position relative also sometimes. And most of the work today is going to be about how that transverse magnetization can generate a voltage through Faraday's law of induction. How that voltage can be converted to a complex signal, a complex valued signal, a real and imaginary component, using a couple different processes called phase sensitive detection and also quadrature detection. So some signal processing that allows us to get to this complex signal. And then how is that complex signal actually related to the case based signal? And we'll get into that. We'll see it a little bit how we actually go then from case based to an image. That'll come up more when we talk about uh, image reconstruction. So this is our this is our pipeline today jump through a lot of this without getting into too much specifics about the gradient encoding and the, and the gradient decoding itself. That'll come up more when we get actually to the imagery or the, uh, sorry, spatial localization of course. Um, so I want to introduce the concept of case space. You've heard it some, you've maybe seen it in another class, and I want to give you one sort of piece to hold on to for today. We're going to talk a lot about case space over the next um, at least four or maybe five lectures even. And of course, it's, it's fundamental to uh, you'll see a little bit where this comes from today, but there, there is a relationship that specifically relates gradient waveforms as a function of time. If you turn a gradient on, it stays on for some period of time, and you turn a gradient off. That gradient waveform might be just a box function, but it could be something much more elaborate too, depending on exactly what you're trying to accomplish. Nevertheless, it could be a function of time. And if we integrate those gradient waveforms as a function of time, multiplied by some constants, that defines for us actually where we are in the case space or the K data that we're actually acquiring. And so the, the, the thing I want you to remember today is that gradients move us through K space. If we turn on gradients, we can move where we are acquiring data in K space. And the reason that's true is because of this relationship. Why we define this as, as K space, why this definition exists is uh, will sort of come up towards the very end of the lecture. But the basic idea is let's take, for example, this gradient waveform. Turn a gradient on, it's on for some period of time, and turn it off. At the very beginning, if my gradients uh, have been off, then if I integrate this expression at that point in time, I just have k0. And k0, by definition, is right in the middle of the uh, case space diagram. So we have negative k space, and we also have positive k space. And it's a two dimensional space, which we can sort of move through with different gradients. And if we integrate this expression uh, according, if we integrate this gradient waveform as a, according to this expression, can see what k is, and k is just increasing as a function of time. So we go from the middle of k space, uh, outward in a positive direction, we have a positive gradient after all, and then we move further off in a positive direction. So conceptually, I just want you to remember today that gradients move us through k space. And, and why is that important? Well, we have to move through you know, what I'll call all of k space 
open up our receiver system to sample the transverse magnetization and then record and write that data down into the system, right? And so our goal today is going to be partly to understand how it is that we can move around the space, at least conceptually, and then we'll, we'll get into the math even more when we talk about the spatial localization picture. Is that conceptually what we can see out of it? We'll talk about it. Okay, so we talked about this sequence already, at least uh, uh, so you saw some diagrams for this. So this is the spoiled gradient echo sequence, or at least something close to it. Uh, and what's shown right now is slice selection here. Uh, we're going to talk a lot more about this on Thursday, but the idea of slice selection is that we have an RF pulse in combination with the gradient. And so this RF pulse is uh, sensitive or, or it contains a certain bandwidth of frequencies. This gradient sets up a distribution of frequencies, and so that RF pulse will excite a particular slice in the body. We'll get much more into that later. So we have slice selection and the spoiler gradient is shown on the end there, the one that gets rid of the transverse magnetization. And so remembering that gradients move us through k-space, uh, the gradient echo sequence itself actually starts with two gradients that might look something like this. A positive, what we call phase encoding gradient, and a negative, what we call frequency encoding gradient. And not worrying too much about what a phase or a frequency encoding gradient, just appreciate the relationship between these gradients and where we started in k-space and where we ended. So it was a positive phase encode gradient. That's going to move us up. Up is uh, the up-down axis or the y-axis, which is, is typically, by convention, our phase encoding axis. And then we have a frequency encoding uh, gradient, which is negative. And so during time, uh, it's going to move us in the negative direction. But together, they're going to move us out to some, uh, to some point like this in k-space. So that's the function, if you will, of those two points in k-space. And now we have another gradient, which we call the readout gradient. And the readout gradient, we saw this when you worked through the expression for the gradient echo. The readout gradient here will allow us to generate and form an actual echo. During the application of that gradient, you will again be moving across uh, k-space because gradients move us through k-space. This is a positive x gradient. It's going to move us along in a positive x direction or in the y direction. So this is what these gradients, this is how these gradients will move us through k-space. Um, I don't think I diagrammed it here, but for the spoiled gradient echo sequence, this gradient here effectively returns us back to the middle of k-space again. It gets rid of the transverse magnetization, and in doing so, we sort of go back to our origin. Uh, there's lots of steps like this, right? So when we open up our receiver system, something we'll talk a lot about today, that echo there, that data that we're able to acquire, it fits into a particular spot in k-space. We know what our phase encoding gradients are. We know where this line of k-space belongs in some matrix, right? We slot it into the highest element. But there's lots of these steps, right? Uh, let's see, yeah. So there's lots of these steps. We have different phase encoding steps that could move us out to, a, say, a shallower position. This gradient is half its height, or rather half its area. And half the area won't move us up quite as high. But we still have the same negative gradients, and we still move just as far as we can. And the whole imaging experiment, again, is about reading out data generally along what we call the readout direction, or the frequency encoding direction. And in this case, we get another line of echo data to slot into our matrix of information we're trying to acquire to build up everything we need for our image. And the whole imaging process just repeats itself many, many times. So in this case, what's really changing is the phase encoding gradient, right? We're cycling through five examples of the phase encoding gradient. The middle example is right here, meaning it's really not turned on, it's not really turned off. And that means it's just the frequency encoding that's moving us through uh, k-space. So for this yellow line here, we're really just moving to the left and then moving back. So again, gradients move us through k-space. We have to uh, def you know, define these gradient amplitudes and their timings pretty specifically so that we're moving through and collecting the points in k-space that would be useful to reconstruct an image. Now, it's not obvious what points in k-space we need yet, but we need a bunch of them, right? This would just be five echoes. You're not going to have a very good image. We need hundreds of echoes. So, Yeah, that's right. And so there, there are a couple, uh, we should probably be clear about a couple conventions because unfortunately there's several. And so the le in, in k-space, the left-right direction is usually called the readout direction. It's also called the kx direction. We take that as the x direction conventionally and usually when we're talking about reading out, forming the echo, the echo is forming as a function of time along the x direction. And then the up-down direction we take here is the phase encode direction. Obviously, where we are on that axis is governed by the phase encoding gradient. Uh, more simply, sometimes it's just called the KY axis, K stands for KY. And then, in fact, uh, did Mike talk about 3D imaging? If he did, I think it was 
complicated. Uh, it doesn't matter for now. Uh, but the point is that you can also do phase encoding out of this plane. So you can get you can get k data that's in another plane and another plane and another plane. And in doing so, you can actually encode information over a three-dimensional volume, not just a slice. And that's a sort of unique attribute. Yep. Uh, end of the day, if you have all of your case space data case space data acquired, the 2D Fourier transform will give you some imaging data. In this case, we have, you know, maybe 15 different images during the cardiac cycle, so we have to look through case space 15 times to be able to build a movie like that. Uh, but uh, that's, a, that's a, a detail that we can teach you about that we get into. Uh, oh, right. And that's just to remind you that we have to spoil our magnetization. Right? Uh, there's another pulse sequence, a great one, where there's a little element that is recycled because the gradient actually gradients themselves are turning back to one another. So you can, you can be wasteful and use the gradient pulse sequence and you can balance SSLP sequence and recycle it. Cool. Uh, so this is the comment I made a little bit earlier about uh, calculating scan time. It's one of the learning objectives for aid. It's not a complicated concept. It just simply says that the time for a given scan, how long it takes us to acquire the image, depends on our TR, depends on the number of phase encode lines. And in fact, we could repeat that whole process, right? You can get the whole, you can get all of case space twice, or three times, or ten times. Uh, and we call that averaging. Uh, and the reason to do that is if you have a low image quality, it may be useful to acquire the image four times and average it to push the noise down to its uh, signal that has a, a better appearance in the presence of noise. So let's just think about this quickly. Uh, we said we get one phase encode step per TR. Each phase encode step will acquire, a, say, a single echo. We might need 128 echoes to build you know, a decent image. And even at that, that's kind of low resolution if you compare it to something like uh, CT, which might be you know, 256 or 512 element uh, array for reconstructed images, or digital mammography or digital x-ray could be 1024. So in MRI, we're typically talking about resolutions that are you know, kind of on, on the, well, resolution is a little tricky, but number of data points along a single direction on the order of like 128, maybe less, maybe as high as 256, and it's hard to get you know, sort of high average generally. Uh, again, where mammography or, or, or high-res uh, CT might push up to 1024, so the order of magnitude of the quality matters. Uh, if we just do the simple uh, calculation here, we can see that in the, in the case of having a long TR, uh, like 2,500 milliseconds, what, when will, what's an example of needing or wanting a long TR? What kind of image would you want? Radiac or spin echo? Spin echo. T1 weighted or T2 weighted? T2 weighted, right? So T2 weighted image has a long TR, so the T1 effects are dissipated. Uh, so in this example here, 2,500 milliseconds times 128 lines that we need to acquire, it'll take five minutes to acquire this data, right? So you go back to the 80s and the 90s, uh, 80s, and you read MR papers, and they say, we acquired a spin echo image in about 12 minutes, right? And you go, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's almost, it's hard to believe they even had a lot, you know, could do anything funded to do this, right? Mm -hmm. But it was so, you know, at the time, of course, so remarkable that, that the field kept pushing, and then at the end, physicians are saying, okay, you guys gotta keep working on it, right? <laughs> not acceptable. Uh, and of course, there's so many tricks now in MR, and it's really, that's actually kind of some of the fun now, is, is all the different ways, all the mutually compatible ways that people have sort of discovered to really get the high scan that you want. Uh, and this movie that uh, has been sort of bothering me the whole time, is just showing the example of when you have fewer lines of case space, you have a blurrier and blurrier image. You couldn't possibly resolve it in the same detail unless you get high, high, uh, more and more lines in case space. Again, conceptually, we'll come back to this stuff. Okay, so this is at the end of the lecture. I'm hoping we got all the way there. At the end of the lecture, this is the expression we're trying to understand. This is the MRI signal e equation, sort of the, one of the most fundamental relationships that comes out of uh, MR imaging specifically. And so what we're hoping to understand is how the signal at points in case space, right? We have this array I keep showing you, this sort of hot color map of, you know, little data points everywhere. A single point has an amplitude, has a phase two, but has an amplitude. And we want to know, uh, we want to understand better what the signal at a single point in case space represents. And what we'll see today is it represents Faraday's law of induction, meaning we get signal from the entire excited volume. We play an RF pulse to excite some tissue. All of that tissue generates signal that's received by our coil. The trick is being able to sort of break down all of that received signal into its important components that ultimately get us images. Um, 
behind here is meant to be the object, not the image itself, right? So the object has some has some state of transverse magnetization at the point that you're acquiring the data, and the state of the transverse magnetization depends on things like the spin echo, depends on things like the green echo, and the TE and the TR, the T1 and the T2, and all these things. And of course, it depends on the spatial position that we're talking about. Uh, here, time zero just represents sort of like the, the echo time. And what we don't totally understand yet, what we're going to learn about today, is how the MR imaging system effectively takes the state of transverse magnetization created by a series of RF pulses and gradients that you're using, multiplies it by what we call a case space sampling function. Uh, and so this case space sampling function is basically a way of saying how much of my object, uh, uh, how much of this pattern is contained in my object? Does my object have a lot of this pattern or not very much of this pattern? And the connection conceptually uh, here is that the K space is related to the integral of our gradient wave flux. That was something I showed you three or four slides ago. So high level thinking, we're gonna get our, ourselves all the way there. But the MR experiment is continuously asking how much of this pattern is contained in my object. And if I sample through enough of these patterns, it's the Fourier decomposition theory, if I sample through enough of these different patterns of specific kinds, I can evaluate uh, ultimately, through a Fourier transform, an image of my underlying object in the state of the underlying object's transverse magnetization. So, high level stuff, and see if we can uh, actually put all of that in. Okay, so how do we measure MXY? So, this you should understand just sort of conceptually already. We can create a state of transverse magnetization, we have a coil nearby, and it's going to generate some oscillating signal, nominally at the log frequency. Uh, so, processing spins will induce a current from some nearby. Uh, there's another slightly different way to look at this, and that's what happens when we turn on a gradient. Here, we'll, look at, uh, we'll be looking at Faraday's law in the rotating frame. So rather than the laboratory frame where everything's ripping at 64 megahertz, we can turn on a gradient, national frequencies left, right, if you turn on, say, a left, right gradient or this gradient. And so these spins here are actually not precessing in the rotating frame because they're at the log frequency. And then spins to the left or right will be slightly faster or slightly And then if we turn on uh, uh, a receiver coil to listen, we can listen to just the excited slice and maybe pick up the frequency of these spins over here. Uh, we would only listen to those spins if we only excited this slice, for example. Alternately, we can excite a different slice here on the left-hand side. And if we excite that left-hand side, then we'll get a different frequency of oscillation for those specific spins. So there's some connection here, right, between frequency and space. And that's something that we're going to have to draw out. And the real trick here is to encode that spatial information uh, and the image contrast in the echo. I think we know how to get the image contrast in. The question is now how do we get the imaging information into the echo? Uh, and then the 2D FT is what gets us back to the images themselves. Okay, so this is the process we have to work through today. We have some underlying object, and we can play our pulses, generate a state of some transverse magnetization, functional space, functional time. That will give us a voltage that we uh, detect in a nearby coil through Faraday's law of induction. And what we haven't talked about uh, yet, but will today, is how we can take a, voltage uh, take a voltage signal, pass it through what's called a phase sensitive detector, two of them in fact, and then mix and combine that signal into a so-called complex signal, it'll be a complex valued signal. And the value of a complex signal is that we can describe the state of the magnetization in the transverse plane, not just its amplitude, right, but where is it? If we know it's we know it's real and imaginary components. We know what, which way the transverse magnetization is pointed. And that can be a very useful thing. After we form that, uh, this complex signal is a function of time, we can use the applied gradients. These are the, uh, the frequency encoding gradients. We can use the frequency encoding gradients uh, to define a case space signal. And, that, case, and, and that, that transformation there is what allows us to bridge from a time-based signal to a case space-based signal. And that's what we really care about. We want to be able to put points in that case-based matrix. We don't care about time sort of at the end of all the processing. If we can put all of our S of Ks into the right places in case-space, uh, then we can form, uh, we can complete the case-based matrix or array that we need for that particular imaging experiment, do a Fourier transform, and, and obtain the underlying image. And we'll have to get at uh, sort of uh, you know, a deeper and deeper understanding of why it is that it's the Fourier transform that operationally takes us from case-space uh, back to that's, that's something we'll have to deal with in part today and then in some 
So at this point, just thinking back to sort of where we are in this class, I think we know how to prepare the transverse magnetization of that. Spin upload, gradient upload, conversion pulses, saturation pulses, uh, lots, lots of options. Uh, fat water separated imaging with gradient upholes is another example. So many and several examples. And we'll, we'll see some more sort of applications and clinical applications of that later on in the class. Um, you know, a little bit about spatial encoding. We sort of get the idea that we need to do it. So we link gradients, adjust frequencies at, at spatial positions. So there's some connections here. And we've got to dig into those a little bit. Um, and one of the big ones that we have to get at today is how does the transverse magnetization get actually converted into this case? And that's what this whole uh, mess is all about. So that's our, that's our big job for today. Okay, so we break it down into steps. The first thing is how do we take our, our transverse magnetization, which is uh, you know, different at every point in space and is, is changing as a function of time, how do we get that transverse magnetization to actually give us a, a detectable voltage signal that we might be able to sample and measure with some digital acquisition system? Uh, okay, so a little bit more specifically here, we, we, uh, RF pulse generates a state of transverse magnetization, and we know that the voltage signal uh, that we can detect in a coil depends on the time rate of change of the magnetic flux through the coil. So we're going to have to work out an expression that helps us understand what the flux is, the magnetic flux through the coil is, and then we're going to have to take the partial derivative of that that actually goes back to a voltage signal. So that's the, one of the goals today. But we have to understand what this flux uh, expression looks like. First of all. So this is sort of a simple expression that you probably saw at some point in physics, which just says the amount of flux through you know, some loop of wire or some, uh, some element that you care about is, uh, is accords with integrating over the area of the coil uh, in the B field dotted with uh, the particular directional area of the field uh, itself. So if we're talking about the B field you know, uh, uh, fluxing through some surface, some arbitrary surface, we have to know the surface normal and the B field is dot product integrate all of that in the coil with the magnetic field flux. So it's kind of how much uh, magnetic field is moving throughout the coil or something like this. Uh, so this is an expression that comes out of the book. And it's a little hard uh, to, to appreciate exactly where it comes from, but I want to give you a little bit of intuition for it. So rather than using the expression that we had on the previous uh, slide, this is what we have to use here. So this describes the magnetic flux through the coil through the principle of what's called reciprocity. Let me ex explain the terms, and we'll talk about them a little bit. The idea is that magnetic flux through that coil depends on the integral uh, across the object of the B field, which is uh, what we call the receiver's B field. And this is this conceptually is not sort of an obvious thing. We'll talk about it. We refer to this as the coil sensitivity, and it basically means that if you don't have a good coil and you have no sensitivity for detecting the magnetization, uh, then this would be something like zero, and there'd be no essentially no flux or no detectable flux, and then we wouldn't be able to get a voltage off of that. So the coil sensitivity here refers to uh, the B field that's basically generated by the coil if you ran a current through the coil. Here we're talking about a flux through the coil generating a current, but the, the principle of reciprocity lets us turn that around. So we can describe it as, uh, as the coil, the receiver's B field itself. Uh, what matters is the dot product of the so-called coil sensitivity with the state of the magnetization. And here I define it very generally, right? This isn't even just the transverse magnetization. I'm just saying the bulk magnetization. I'm going to show you today uh, why it's the case that we're not sensitive to detecting the MZ component of the magnetization. But right now we're just leaving it as a bulk magnetization vector. So a couple things to sort of think about here. What happens if the coil has poor sensitivity? I alluded to this before. We want, we want well-engineered coils, and you could build coils that are really sensitive to detecting the transverse magnetization, but pretty insensitive. And so the coil guys are all about making sure the sensitivity of this coil is high. If the sensitivity is poor or very low, we don't, we, we effectively have no dot product here. We have no, no uh, measurable flux, if you will, and then that won't generate a useful voltage for us to uh, detect and measure. Uh, Another thing to think about is what happens if the coil sensitivity is actually perpendicular to the bulk magnetization, okay? So what happens to dot products when two vector quantities are perpendicular? This is zero, right? Okay, so why am I, why am I talking about this? Well, picture, um, picture the coil is a loop of wire, right? And we've always been talking about transverse magnetization. So you put me in the scanner, and the magnetization is always processing somewhere in this axial plane, right? 
So I need to have a loop of wire. Do I need a loop of wire that's parallel to the axial plane or perpendicular to the axial plane? Perpendicular, right? That's gonna that's gonna be that's gonna give me the most flux through my coil, right? If I turn that coil to be uh, per if I turn it to be parallel, in this case the loop of wire will be parallel to the transverse magnetization. I won't get any flux through that coil, right? So all the coils that we place on your body are always going to have loops of wire that are sort of have an image normal that's in the transverse plane. If, you, if, that, if the sorry, if the coil's normal is perpendicular to the transverse plane, the sensitivity drops off a lot, and you won't have any sort of useful signal coming out. So we have small coil elements. We can put a small coil element on your shoulder. We can put it on your you know on your chest or something like that. If I put it on the top of your head, for example, though, I get very little signal coming out. It's simply like a wrong orientation. So the dot product. Okay, uh, so what we have to uh, work on and understand, at least conceptually, is what do I really mean by coil sensitivity? Uh, and as, as with any sort of, sort of, many of the sort of fields and things that we talk about today, uh, or in this class rather, uh, we can talk about both its magnitude and we can talk about its phase. So the B field for the receiver has both a magnitude and a phase. So what does that mean? Well, uh, interesting. Uh, so we have lots of coils that we can use in MR imaging, right? One of the go to a good clinical imaging center, they're going to have, you know, this is a wrist coil, this is a head coil, uh, this is a breast coil, foot and ankle coil, uh, knee coil, shoulder coil, lots of examples, right? Because we want to get this coil elements as close as possible to the anatomy that we care about. So let's, let's look at a more specific example. I want to do cardiac imaging. I might place two coils anteriorly, right? Loops of wire towards the top of my chest and maybe towards the middle of my chest. Those coils themselves will only see certain aspects of the anatomy, uh, meaning they will see the anatomy that's very close to the coil. They won't see the anatomy that's further from the coil. They have what we call a sensitivity profile. Right? They're sensitive to things that are very close to them. They're insensitive to things that are very far away. And so what's being shown in these diagrams here is the, the sensitivity of those two coils in the field of view for the image that we want to acquire. So a picture that we want to acquire an image, I think it's going to show an image that goes kind of perpendicular to the subject that's shown in the back. This top coil here, coil one, is going to be really sensitive to things that are anterior towards the head, because the coil is anterior and towards the head. This coil down here is going to be sensitive to things that are a little bit more inferior, but also anterior. And so it's brighter here compared to the other. We have two more coils, we can place them on the back, and they'll each have different sensitivity profiles. So again, if we're talking about acquiring an image that's perpendicular to the subject, each of these four coils is closer to one of the corners of the image, if you will, and each of the coils has a sensitivity profile that's, that's highest or largest in the corners of those coils. That means that the receiver coil itself colors the acquired data, right? Meaning it gets high sensitivity for magnetization that's close to it here, and not a strong further away. That doesn't mean that the, that the transverse magnetization is weaker here. It's just the coil's ability to detect the magnetization is weaker there. And so most of our uh, MR systems use several coils and combine information. We'll talk about this at the very end of the lecture, but combine information from many coils, what we call channels. So this is a four-channel array. We can combine images from all those to get a sort of more uniform image over a pretty large field of view. And so this is what the images from those individual locations might look like. Uh, and it's, I don't know if the lights are great, but the point is that you know, towards each of those corners, near the proximity of the actual coil, the image itself is actually brighter. So there's different ways to combine those, but you can imagine that if I have relatively bright image information in each of the four corners, combining it should give me something that's pretty uniform and complete in that. So that's what we mean by the, uh, the receiver uh, uh, magnitude, if you will. This is another example, a simpler example, shown uh, in a, just acquiring images in a phantom. So uh, let's imagine we just have a, a ball of water in the middle of the scanner, and I have a coil placed, uh, let's see, a coil placed on the bottom and a coil placed on the top. If it's placed on the top, it's sensitive to the state of the transverse magnetization at the top. Placed on the bottom, it's sensitive to this stuff. We can plot, we can actually measure these things with MR as well. We can plot the magnitude of the, of the received B field uh, and show that there's obviously a difference between those two coils because there are different spatial locations. Uh, the uh, coil itself also adds a phase to the underlying signal. So this is an example of the magnitude weighting that happens because of the coil itself, not because of the object, but because of the coil. And you'll see this mathematically, so it's important to sort of uh, at least get some insight to it. 
but the receiver of coil itself can also add phase to our magnetization or a pair of phase to the magnetization. And we need to know about that so that we can you know, either disregard it because it's not important for that experiment or deal with it if in fact it is a time stress. So bottom line, the coil that we use for imaging can change the magnitude of the phase of the received signal. So back to this expression here, we said uh, what we're really interested in is, is the magnetic flux, uh, and that's related to the coil sensitivity and its dot product with the bulk magnetization, not just transverse, but the whole bulk magnetization. Uh, and we know uh, Faraday's law of induction, if we take into account uh, also this principle of reciprocity, we can get a, a voltage expression, which just says uh, what we care about is the partial derivative of this integral, uh, which comes out of the, uh, the, the dependence on the coil sensitivity so what we need to do is really pick apart uh, this expression here to try to really understand what this voltage signal looks like so we can do some things with it to make it a, a more useful signal for ultimately getting us to phase space. Okay? Uh, so that's the first test. Okay, so I'm going to start by just writing that same expression that we had. The voltage as a function of time is equal to minus the partial of the integral of the I of the B from our uh, the B field from our receiver, which is a function of space. Uh, it's not a function of time, right? These are stale. It's just a function of space, uh, and that's dotted with bulk magnetization, which of course can be a function of space, right? And then we close out uh, the integral, and then just remembering, I said it just a second ago, that this B receiver field is not some function of time. That just means that this hardware element that we call the coil is just stable, right? That may not be exactly true, uh, but in general it's just a hardware component that's sitting there. Okay. Uh, so let's write down for this B receiver field, then we'll write it out in component notation because uh, that'll be useful for us in a second here. So our B receiver field is a function of space, just has some expression that looks like uh, BR on the X component along the I direction plus BR Y component along the Y direction, J hat direction, plus BR in the Z direction. So that's just the vector notation for uh, the B receiver field. Um, what we need to do then is just write out that dot product to get us ahead. Uh, you can probably do that as fast or faster than me. Uh, we have minus the partial, the integral of the object. And then we have dot products here. We know what the transverse magnetization, or the, sorry, the bulk magnetization looks like, right? And so we have a, a big bracketed term here that's just the individual for the B receiver field. I'll just write that. Uh, on the I hat direction, the B receiver Y component plus the B receiver Z component. And that's dotted with our bulk magnetization, which we would just write as Space and time along the i hat direction plus m y function of space and time along the j direction plus m z function of space and time. So that's just expanding. I guess I need to close out my integral here. What we want to do now is take uh, the partial derivatives of this thing. Uh, recognizing that it's just the, the components of the magnetization that are functions of time. And so we'll uh, carry through uh, that, uh, carrying the partial derivative inside, we just have minus 
integral in the number. Uh, and I'll write out three specific terms now uh, once I go through the dot product itself, right? So then I have the G receiver field along the x direction, which could be a function of space, multiplied on the partial of D, uh, sorry, of mx, which is a function of space. And, uh, and that's specifically on the i hat direction. So just multiplying out the dot product and taking the partial derivative of the only thing I can, it's only the mx component that varies as a function of time. And I need to do that for the other terms as well. Two more terms, I have an E and an R, so a comma Y term, uh, which could be a function of space, multiplied onto a partial term, which is a D MY, which is a function of space. Uh, so we just go on the J direction. Just the second, the second B field term times the second uh, full parameterization term. And then we have one last term, uh, which just takes into for the receiver field, uh, which could be a function of space, dotted with the mz component, which is a function of space and time, along the j-hat direction, and closing that off by the function of time. Okay. So, so far mostly algebra, right? So, uh, what we need to think about is, well, one thing to think about first is, what is, what's the coordinate system for this particular expression or implementation? It's not an obvious question, but the signal that we're trying to receive, is that a laboratory signal or a rotating frame signal? It's a laboratory frame signal, right? So you're gonna see that show up a little bit later. And the thing that'll make it obvious that it's a laboratory frame signal is you'll see things like omega, right? Things that depend on the longer frequency. And one of, procedurally, one of our steps today is to get rid of that dependence on the longer take this whole expression from something uh, precessing at the longer frequency down to what we call a baseband, down to some uh, lower frequency signal for uh, getting us to kill space. So uh, we can think about some of these individual terms uh, now. So let's think about um, just the mx term, for example. So we have, uh, let's start with x. So we have m and x, which is a function of space and time, right? Uh, and the time at which we're acquiring the data itself is a period of free precession, right? We might have a gradient turned on, but we're just listening to the signal during a very short period of time. We're not forcing it to precess. It's naturally just free precessing. And so our x magnetization as a function of time should just look something like uh, a cosine times, say, a gamma of E0 times time. This is just sort of it's a proportionality, right? There's, there's a weighting term that can be in there about the magnitude of it, but we know it's a processing uh, component of magnetization. And we know our MY component is the same. So our MY component as a function of space and time is just, oops, I did this too, but proportional to something like a sine. Our last term that I want to uh, talk about is obviously the MZ component. What is our mz component as a function of space and time? It's proportional uh, during the time that we're actually sampling the signal. Is it changing very much? We're only sampling the signal for like a millisecond or maybe even a couple milliseconds, but a pretty short period of time. And so our mz magnetization during the time that we're detecting that flux, recording that voltage, is really just proportional to some initial condition, maybe some mz kind of constant. It's an assumption that we make because we're not sampling the magnetization for very, for very long. Um, what we care about, though, is not really the states of the magnetization, but, it, uh, but in this expression here, oh, I'm sorry, the partial is not that long. What we care about here is just the partials of the, uh, of the components of the bulk magnetization, right? So now if we go from here and say, well, what's happening to dmx, for example, right? We know it's just this uh, cosine-like function, and so it ends up looking proportional to something like minus gamma d0 cosine of gamma 
the same thing for DMY or D times I. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Guess that goes to sign. Uh, here we have our DM uh, partial derivative of our MY term uh, as a function of time, just being proportional to something like cosine. So we have gamma e zero cosine. Uh, and then the last one is if we look at what happened to our MZ magnetization, right? So the partial of MZ as a function of time is just equal to zero because it's a constant, right? And so that gives us a little bit of insight of, as to what's going on. These first two terms here, right? These are a, a consequence of free precession. That's the first thing. And these are also large in some sense. Uh, the magnitude of these terms depends on things like gamma, which is big, B0 is maybe good, big. Big is a relative term that has to be sort of relative to something else, but certainly big relative to anything that, any other description of what's happening with MZ. Here we took it as constant, maybe it's slightly time varying, but bottom line is very close to zero. And so uh, this term here, the Z term on the bottom here, we take this as being very small. And so this is your first insight to the fact that we don't really detect what's happening with the MZ magnetization, right? The X and Y components are zipping around, right? Megahertz frequencies. This thing is barely doing anything, even if you don't like this assumption and want to write some exponential or something, you can, but it's still really slow. And so what we're sensitive to from a detection perspective is transverse magnetization. Uh, because of its rate, its rate is very, very, very high, and then also because of how close we want it to flows, flows themselves. Okay. Um, back to this. Let me um, so let me just point out then uh, what we're basically left with at this point, right? We have a B receiver field X component, and we have a B receiver field Y component, right? And we know what the uh, DMX uh, DT term looks like, and we know what the DMY DT term looks like. So I want to rewrite this last expression just as the product of uh, having taken the partial derivative, okay? So to do that, i got to wipe out some stuff and get some other things out of here. Anyone need something that's here? Oh, I guess, yeah, no, you're right, you're right, you're right. Sorry, that's a carry. Yeah, so you're saying uh, once I carry out the dot product, they're just terms, they're just uh, magnitudes yeah. at that point, right? Yeah. yeah. So, and then you don't, so what you just said about distinction between things in X and Y, so for them it's not just a term, but you have. Yeah, we don't have any I dot J's, right? We have. I dot J would be an X term. Yes. And we just have the. Yeah. It's still the one just that's among them, right? Just that term. Yeah, it should. Yeah, that's right. Right? So, those should, so that shouldn't. Uh, you're saying after I took the products here, these should. Yes, yeah, so it's just. Them, yeah. Right. Not, not at this point. Okay. We're gonna see, we're gonna see how that's even possible, you know, twenty minutes from now. So I keep that question in mind if it doesn't yeah. show up. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna basically fill in for this expression here now that we know what the functions are. Okay. Takes me just a second. 
right, so what we end up uh, with in that case then is we still have uh, the inner goal of the round effect. And now we just have two dot product, or two uh, visible terms. We have the uh, uh, B field for X component of the function of space times, uh, I wrote it out, but something like DMX is a function of space and that's the function of time, plus our B receiver field y direction uh, times the function of z Okay, so what I want to do uh, for now is call this expression a, because we're going to need it uh, a little bit later, and we'll come back to it. Um, Uh, and we're basically left with these four terms that we have to better understand, right? We've talked about, you know, sort of what these, the partial terms here for bulk magnetization are. We'll talk more about what the receiver terms are as well. So it should be more clear. Okay. Um, so we go back to uh, thinking about our transverse magnetization itself. We haven't seen this exact expression before, but the transverse magnetization, mxy, as a function of it depends on a bunch of things. It depends on some initial condition. We call this MXY not. And what I mean by the initial condition in this case here is, is things like the spin angle, right? Or the gradient angle. And then that, of course, depends on TDs and TRs and things like that. So it really means what's the state of the magnetization when I want to begin actually measuring and sampling it, for example. Now, even during the process of measuring and sampling the signal, it has the potential to decay. So it's reprocessing, so we know the decay is according to e to the minus t or the t2 star. So remember that echo forms over a finite period of time. It has some state of magnetization initially, but that state, of course, is reprocessing and will have some decay associated with it. If we write this as a, as a, laboratory, uh, uh, as a laboratory frame term, then we also need to include precession, which we haven't really written it this way before, but so this, uh, sorry, just remind me over here, this is just T2 decay. And this term here is precession. So you can recognize that as a laboratory uh, uh, frame term. And then another thing that we saw a second ago, and I'll describe it uh, here now again, is the, is the phase from the RF pulse. So the RF pulse itself can impart phase on our transverse magnetization. We've sometimes included it, we sometimes have it. And this is just a way of, uh, of, of suggesting that through the application of an RF pulse, there will be some phase on our magnetization as well. It's important to sort of recognize what each of these terms mean. Um, so I should write this here, this is the RF pulse. Uh, and at different points during sort of today, we'll describe whether or not we need to hang on to them or whether we can sort of pass on them. If we go from this expression to writing out uh, two components the two components of the magnetization, we could write out that our MX magnetization is a function of space and time, is just equal to some magnitude of the initial condition, which is our MXY naught, which could be a function of space, uh, at some what we'll call initial time zero. Um, we also have to we still keep the decay term, so we still decay according to e to the minus t or the t2 star. Um, but if we're talking about just the x component, we're thinking about free precession, uh, then maybe that's the cosine term. So we write it as the cosine of minus omega, which can be a function of space, right? We can change our local larval frequency by, for example, turning on a gradient. And so this will be a really important term to sort of keep tabs on today. Uh, we're gonna, this is where you begin to see sort of where spatial localization can show up. Um, uh, this is times time, of course. Uh, plus the phase from the receiver, or from the RF pulse itself. Uh, and that could, in fact, be a function of space, believe it or not. So when we play an RF pulse, we want to get a certain amplitude, we want to get a certain phase, but the, the sample that we're imaging combined with the V1 coil that we're using for exciting will give us a phase on our object. Uh, that phase may, in fact, be a function of space as well, parts of time. Uh, and we can similarly write out the same thing for the MY component. 
So we just write that our my component is a function of space, it's a function of time. It still depends on that same magnitude, the m x y naught, which is a function of space and its initial time. It still decays as some exponential, e to the minus t over t t star. Uh, but instead of being a cosine term, then we write a sine term. So we have a sine same things, so minus omega is a function of space when we turn on gradients, plus phase when we turn on phase. Sure. So that's just a way of explicitly writing out uh, what are the components of the transverse magnetization, mx and my. Uh, and you can see that we have to do that is take partials of these, right, to get back to understanding our, our voltage effect. Um, just get them space wise if I make them small. Uh, should be okay. Okay, so um, pull them here. So all I, all I need to do now is quickly take the partials of these things. You can probably do it more quickly than, than I can actually write it out, but let's, we'll give it a whack. So we have the partial of dmx is a function of time, mx is a function of space. Uh, and so we have a bunch of constant terms that are going to uh, come out. Uh, uh, the bulk magnetization term, uh, or the, uh, the transverse magnetization term, for example, comes out uh, in front. So we can just write that as an M xy naught, uh, which is a function of space. Not. And then we have two terms that will come out of the partial there, right? The two sort of big terms that will come out. So we, the first term will deal with the exponential, for example. We have one uh, minus one over t two. T two itself can be a function of space, right? It's not uniformly subject to the object. So that's times e to the minus t over t two function of space, and that's multiplied onto. Uh, just make sure I get this right. Yeah. So this is onto our cosine term. So cosine of minus omega is a function of space uh, times time plus the phase from our That's the first term uh, in, in, let's see, it's the first term in the, this is on the brackets here. Yeah. So that's the first term, and then there's a second term underneath here that's, uh, say, leading with the exponential term this time, so e to the minus t over t2 is a function of space, uh, multiplied onto, let's go back here, multiplied onto uh, the partial derivative of the cosine term. So we have omega as a function of Say it again. So that's equal to r. Uh, yes. Yeah. Let me. I'll, I'll fix that in just a second. Is that okay? Uh, so then, just closing out this sign or closing out to this full partial uh, term, you have a minus omega times time uh, or times time omega as a function of space. Sorry. Times time plus the phase. Close up there, and then close up down here. And then you guys wanted me to keep track of a T2 star, right? And so uh, should all be T2 stars, right? Is that your comment? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Kind of messy, of course, these things always kind of get messy and then they get cleaned up a little bit, right? So the next thing is to, and again, you guys can probably do this uh, more quickly than I, is just to carry out the partial uh, derivative as a function of time of the my component. It doesn't look a whole lot different, but uh, if you want to talk about the terms, so let's go ahead and do it. Uh, so now we have the partial uh, of the my magnetization, which is itself a function of space times of time. Take its partial derivative. Still leads the same with the, uh, uh, the mxy not term, mxy not, which could be a function of space and not of time. We can deal with that uh, exponential term. And then we have a big bracketed term. Inside our big bracketed term is uh, something very similar to what we had before 1 over t2 star, which is a function of space, uh, times the exponential e to the minus 
uh, t over t2 star initialization space. Uh, and then this time we had assigned terms, so our assigned term, uh, well, assigned term to stay this time. Uh, so we should have assigned small bracket times minus omega as a function of space times time plus phase space. That's our first term. Our second term, of course, looks similar to the one that we had above it. Uh, we have a minus sign this time. Uh, so we have a minus t, yeah, the minus t over t2 star as a function of space. Uh, and that's multiplying onto something like omega r uh, cosine of this function, a bracketed term that looks like minus omega of r uh, plus phi r of space. Okay, so that was a lot more sort of effort than, than maybe it really uh, needed. The point was just taking the partial derivatives of these two terms so we could look at some individual terms and talk about what's going on. So the first thing to compare, uh, let's, let's just take the top expression, right? And if you look carefully inside it, we have some cosine term, we have some sine term, and they're sort of operating on the same thing. So their magnitudes are similar. So then what you have in front is a 1 over t2 term, right? So if we look at, say, uh, comparing just that term, let's see, did I get that much off? Just comparing the 1 over t2 term to the omega as a function of spatial position. These are the principal differences between these two terms inside the big bracket, right? These are things that have magnitudes. How does the magnitude of 1 over t2 star compare to the magnitude of omega? What's omega, roughly? So this is our Larmor frequency, right? Or something close to our Larmor frequency. It could be made a function of space when we turn on the gradient. With no gradients, then omega as a function of r is just omega zero, or just the Larmor frequency. So in principle, this term here is just the Larmor frequency, right? I'm just specifically talking about So this is on what, what kind of hertz is this? How many cycles per second is this? Megahertz, right? So millions of megahertz, right? This also has units that look like hertz, right? It's one over time, all right? It's one over times that are short, but not that short, something like T2 star, right? So this is like one over 100 milliseconds, right? This is not a very big number compared to this omega here. And what that means is this whole term is actually something we're not really sent for the not a, it's a very small component of this partial derivative of the omega term, right? So that means this whole term, right, because that's multiplicative in the front, this whole term here is something very close to zero. Okay? So that's convenient. Uh, and then, of course, we see the same thing for the, for the my component as well. They were structured very similarly. So we still have a T2 star term here. We still have an omega R term here. But... We're adding these two terms together. We're adding something tiny to something that's huge, all right? And so in, in relative terms, this thing here, too, is also pretty close to zero. And our goal, as you can imagine, is to get rid of some of these uh, less important terms if we can. So that helps us uh, get a simpler expression, if you will, for our MX and MY components. Uh, it's not simple, per se. Uh, it depends on something like our initial condition, some decay of the magnetization during the time which we're actually sampling it, uh, the frequency that we care about, and then some cosine terms here uh, that actually get us or link us with the actual spatial infinity or really get close to the spatial infinity. Um, let's define just a couple, a couple more terms that will allow us to eventually get back to equation A, right, where we have the B receiver X term and the B receiver Y term. And so uh, just conceptually, we write down these, those terms to say that our B receiver's X component is, by definition, just the magnitude of that uh, B receiver's uh, uh, sensitivity, just the magnitude, if you will, 
times some phase, right? So you could write this as a cosine of some phi from the receiver itself. All right, the other one, and then we'll just keep that. We also have a y component, and that's defined as, right, just the magnitude. I showed you these pictures a little while ago, right? I said a coil can, mat, can, uh, can have an effect on, uh, the coil does have a sensitivity, meaning it's sensitive to things that are close and less sensitive to things that are far away, and it has some phase. You can add some phase to the receive signal as well. So this term here, uh, this sort of leading term there, we usually call the sensitivity. So I can read. The receiver is called the receiver is the Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so REC is receiver. And so we have so many phases, right? We have a phase from the exciter, which was the RF that showed up over here. We can also add additional phase to our signal depending.